Okay, so we're still um, looking at this question of um, sexual violence. And we had been uh, in the previous video talking um, about sort of understanding the 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 sort of a context uh, in which we sexual violence had become an issue of increasing concern, and we ended up talking about rape culture. And what I want to do now is move on to the more solutions focused part of of um, of this focus. And so we're going to talk about prevention, and we're going to talk about this question of working with men and working with with rape culture. Okay, so. One of the issues that we need to look at is 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 how to not sim not simply how to deal with sexual assault once it has occurred, which is tends to be what the criminal justice system is all about, but how to work it with it in a preventative way. And the problem is that the crime prevention. Um, um, approaches, even those that are not, you know, simply about punishing perpetrators, even the ones that are directed towards crime prevention, have tended historically to focus on on what is what often called target hardening, um, making it harder for perpetrators to 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 um, commit an, uh, an offence against that particular crime target. Okay, and, and that can be anything, whether it's a shop or a person or or anything. Um, but what happens in the case of gender violence is that this 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 has the sort of undesirable effect of of putting all the emphasis on um, sexual violence on the actions of women that it then becomes about individual women must do this or not do that in order to try and avoid being a target of sexual violence. So individual women should not dress in certain ways, should not accept um, drinks or meals or should um, gifts or should not go to certain places or should not um, uh, you know, speak or dress in certain ways. Um, so it becomes really about policing the behavior of women and particularly about policing the sexuality of women. Um, and so th that, that, that although there may be in certain situations a strategic advantage of saying, yes, well, women should do self-defense classes and they should avoid this kind of high risk situation. It does, it, 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 it does two things. Firstly, it leads to victim blaming. It then leads to these kind of after the event questions of why were you there? What were you wearing? Why did you allow that to happen? Um, but it also doesn't actually work preventatively. It doesn't actually say yes, but what, what, was, what made it possible for the perpetrator to do this. So it becomes the, the sort of the emphasis becomes on the victim uh, rather than the perpetrator. And it has a kind of net overall effect and is basically denying uh, people who are vulnerable to sexual violence their, their human rights, their rights to, you know, to move freely, to associate with people, to decide how they want to present themselves or interact. Um, and it and it really ends up in in some strange way not only victim blaming people but but also curtailing the rights of of in, entire groups of people. And although the, and there's been a lot of historical emphasis on those kinds of approaches and 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 they may in certain contexts be helpful, but as an overall intervention, um, they're really not um, the kind of thing we should settle for because of the. The, the fact that it doesn't really deal with um, the perpetrators and it does have negative impact on the victims and on, on, and on vulnerable groups in general. So one of the things we've talked about a lot um, in the course already is this idea of a public health approach. And we, we started talking about that right, in, right at the beginning of the course. Um, and the idea that rather than looking at this simply as a matter of individual criminal offenders, um, and their punishment to look at this as a pervasive social problem um, and, a, and, and a problem that has potential social solutions also. Um, and so that um, is why we ended up talking about rape culture, because rape culture really looks at the social context and it looks and, and says, well, part of, if we're looking at sexual violence, 
um, um, we can look at it in terms of those kinds of underlying factors. But um, it's important to distinguish a number of different sort of levels um, in the public health approach. Uh, and generally, they, they, they sort of categorized as primary, secondary, and tertiary. I'm going to do them backwards now in terms of the explanation. I'm going to start with tertiary because that's the one we, we are least satisfied with at the moment. Okay, so the tertiary, um, the, the, the sort of third stage of, of, of um, uh, response is the ones that happen after the event has occurred. And this is typically where the criminal justice system comes in. It's like after someone has been sexually assaulted, then they go and report a crime, then it's investigated, then it has to go to court. Then if all things run well, the perpetrator is convicted and, and punished in some way. Um, and so the criminal justice system is, is really focused on that, that sort of tertiary level. And the other kind of tertiary intervention is, is not a criminal justice system, um, although ju achieving justice is a, is a big part of it, but it's, it's more the, the psychosocial support of the survivors, that they may need social or, or psychotherapeutic support. And so providing the kind of healing support for survivors is very important. And part of that healing support is in fact ensuring that there is justice, uh, you know, with, within a criminal justice framework. But the problem with the tertiary approach is it kicks in after the thing has happened, that, 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 that the, 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 the terrible events have to have already occurred. And that's not what we want. It's not good enough to say, well, once things, these things have happened, we'll do our best to, to, um, to assist the survivors or punish the perpetrators. We want to actually be doing more so that, the, so, so that these, these acts of violence aren't happening in the first place. That's, that, that's the real um, side. So as with you know, the COVID pandemic, of course, we've got to have the hospitals, the intensive care units, um, the respirators, all of that. But really, we want to, to people to not get that sick. Okay, so the tertiary intervention there is precisely the hospitals, intensive care, respirators, all of that. We, but, but what we really want is people to not get getting infected. We want to keep this, the, uh, throughout society, we want to keep the infection rate low. Okay, and that then brings us to the secondary um, uh, sort of level of intervention, which is, which is also often classified as early intervention. So secondary intervention, secondary um, prevention works with specifically targeting high risk groups and they can be higher groups that are high risk of offending or or groups that are high risk of, of being victimized and you say like in this particular context um there's something going wrong for instance we know that sexual violence against against young adults is actually more common than against older adults. And so we need, to, we need to intervene and we need to have things like Safer Schools Project. We need to have university-based um, kind of sexual violence support systems because those are relatively higher risk contexts or, or in places where, um, where people might be at risk outside their homes. Um, we, need to, we, we need to ensure that there's safety there. Um, so, so identifying these high risk spaces um, and high risk groups, uh, interventions are targeted towards those. Um, and in exactly the same way, for instance, in aged care, there was a failure to intervene, intervene effectively in a very high risk group uh, in terms of the COVID pandemic, is, is that there was, a, there was a known exceptionally high risk group and there should have been strong secondary intervention specifically around aged care. And there wasn't, and the results were absolutely catastrophic. Um, but even that, uh, which, th those uh, interventions which can be effective are, not, are, are only a, one more step towards the solution. What we really want is primary interventions, okay? We, we really want to stop the problem before it occurs. We don't even want there to be high risk groups, okay? And as with the pandemic, primary intervention means physical distancing, mask wearing, hand sanitizing, all of those really, really important ways of stopping the virus even spreading in the same way with, with sexual violence. Um, primary intervention means really 
look, looking at those social factors, the social, economic, cultural um, underpinnings of sexual violence, the constructions of gender that underpin sexual violence. And that's why we were so concerned with rape culture, because rape culture was getting at a whole lot of those things. And it was, it was in giving us a kind of conceptual framework in which we could uh, engage in primary intervention. And we could say, these are the factors that, 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 that actually produce the heightened risk of sexual violence in society. And if we can identify those factors, we can start working out how to address them. Um, so rather than wait until the event has already happened, rather than simply trying to punish the perpetrator, we've got to try and get at the the, the, the preconditions that made the sexual violence um, possible. And, and that's why we want to engage in primary prevention. And as we've talked about before, in this case, a huge part of primary prevention means working with the constructions of masculinities, um, working with social construction of masculinity, social construction of gender inequality. And it means working with men. Okay, um, and we've already talked a lot about about men as being perpetrators and victims of violence and the way in which masculinity um, that often puts men at risk that the toxic forms of masculinity that are that are um, prevalent in in certain social um, environments actually make men at risk of both being perpetrators and of being victims. But what we're going to do now is, 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 is look at this a little more deeply. Is what does it mean to work with, with men in terms of sexual violence? So say that men are the primary perpetrators of sexual violence, not the exclusive perpetrators, but overwhelmingly the main risk group. Um, and within saying that, we also need to say something else, is that most men are not themselves perpetrators of sexual violence. Most men aren't rapists. Um, so when we say that men are the high risk group and they need to be worked with, what are we saying? Because it's the, the models that, 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 that are currently being shown to be effective aren't just the secondary. They aren't just saying, well, these particular men may be at high risk of becoming offenders. It's saying all men may be at high risk. Most of them don't, um, depending on what we even mean. Um, bisexual violence, because as the meanings change, the extent to which men may or may not be um, involved with sexual violence. For instance, far more men are involved with, with date rape than are involved with stranger um, uh, attacks, uh, sexual violence attacks. Um, so people like Jackson Katz, who's, um, who's um, Tough Guys video, um, you should have already watched have already explored this and talked about it um, and talked about um, and and Jackson Katz himself has done a huge amount of work um, and written a book called The Macho Paradox, which is definitely worth reading. Um, and and the model that he's developing there, his primary prevention model is to say that we mustn't only look at perpetrators, we must also look at bystanders. We also need to look at the four out of five men who aren't involved in acts of sexual violence and what role are they playing? Um, and why this is interesting is because it's the bystanders that are also the foundations of rape culture. Um, and the, 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 the model here is a model of kind of routine activity theory, the, 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 a, a kind of a, a model that analyzes what, what, what kind of things become the kinds of things that people do? Um, and all kinds of things, the way, they, the way men talk about women, the, the way men make rape jokes, the way men um, react to, um, to um, when, when, when they want to do something and someone else doesn't want to do it. All those kinds of sort of normalized everyday sorts of practices. Um, and so the so 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 these models um, work not only with men who might be perpetrators, but men who are part of the social networks that actually normalize rape culture, um, and and they address the real difficulties. Like um, 
of, of being in a situation where things that are not actually sexual assault itself, but things that are enabling of rape culture are happening. Um, things like um, the eroticization of sexual violence, um, things like the turning sexual violence into, into, a, in, in, into a joke, turning it into a thing that, that, that um, can be, that, where people act as if that, that, that's a suitable subject for humor. Um, and, and those are far more common, though, though, those sort of everyday, like within certain kinds of pornography, eroticization of violence, within certain kinds of kind of male bonding culture, um, uh, speaking of women in certain sexualized ways um, that are not the sort of um, eroticization of kind of autonomy, but of, 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 of masculine dominance and of sexual objectification. Um, so, so these theories look a little bit more at saying what, what, what we need to do is to work with the normalization of rape culture and we need to work with it primarily with men um, and, to, and to, to create opportunities for men who don't wish to be complicit in sexual violence, who would never themselves violently sexually assault anyone, for them to become far more effective in actually reducing sexual violence by dismantling rape culture, by looking at the specific moments in which sexual objectification, sexual aggression become normalized, um, become tolerated, become rewarded even, um, and to challenge those things. Um, and um, so this quote from Capro says, rape prevention work begins with men and with men's questioning of prevailing assumptions about masculinity and their rethinking of what it means to be a man. The perpetration of rape is traceable to a highly problematic masculinity constituted by sexism, violence, and homophobia. Um, and, and really all that that quote is, uh, is getting is getting at is is, is 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 that men are in exactly the same way as in that school bullying scenario men are involved in producing masculinities all the time they're involved with reaffirming each other's masculinity of negating certain um kinds of masculinity that don't fit with that of of of, of being violent or mocking or humiliating towards forms of masculinity that perhaps show um, different qualities to the, the dominant aggressive forms. Um, and that's exactly the point in which rape culture gets consolidated. Um, and so the question then be becomes, how can we, how can we work in a, in, a, in a way that frees men to be able to not be, um, uh, not be accomplices in sexual violence? Um, how can they still sort of have viable social identities where they are in, in, involved in not collaborating and critiquing and not supporting um, eroticization and normalization of sexual violence. And so this is a huge area of, of um, work, which I'll simply point to, out to you, point out the, the work of people like Jackson Katz as being really important um, and leave it as a, as, as a, model for further exploring the question of prim primary prevention on your own. And of course, linked to that, um, we can go into even more depth um, because we've talked about a number of different things that are actually relevant here. Uh, a number of different things that are relevant to masculinity. Um, and one of the things we looked at when we're talking about masculinity is the links to, to shame and the humiliation of men who, who, who differ from uh, um, these sort of toxic versions of, of, of masculinity and the extent to which men struggle with um, experiences of shame very often. Um, um, but one of the things we talked about when we're talking about violence against children rather than gender violence was also the, the, the whole question of attachment and, and how, how good early attachment creates the conditions for um, the, the, firstly, the, the, the capacity for empathy, the ability to, to trust other people, the ability to recognize other people's feelings and the ability to, 
to respond to those, to actually feel distressed about another person's distress and to feel good when, when, when they feel safe. Um, and how those are actually linked to very specific psychological developmental processes, as well as the ability to work with one's own emotion, to work with negative feelings, feelings of, of abandonment, feelings of humiliation, without reacting with, um, in, in, in states of destructive rage, um, in, 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 in acts of violence against people uh, within one's social world, or, or without reacting to acts of um, humiliation um, by engaging in, um, in acts of dominance, like responding to feelings of sexual rejection by engaging in acts of sexual aggression. Um, so all of those become linked together. And um, I'll read you the, 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 this, this quote um, in, in terms of us looking at, at, at um, violence and nurturance, because we've said that in the sense, violence is the opposite of nurturance. Violence is where the, the ability to care for someone breaks down. And that capacity, that capacity to care and respect and protect people, it, 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 it doesn't break down um, for no reason. It breaks down in context where it isn't supported, that where it isn't supported culturally, it isn't supported developmentally, it isn't supported in the specific sort of situations in which identity is acted out and recognized by other people. Okay, so let's, let's read this um, quote on the violence and nurturance slide. Compassion for self and compassion for others grow together and are connected. This means that men finding and recuperating the lost parts of themselves will heal everyone. If a lot of men grow up learning not to love their true selves, learning that their, their own healthy attachment needs, emotional safety, nurturance, connection, love, trust, are weak and wrong, that's that anyone's attachment or emotional safety needs are weak and wrong. This can lead to two things. They may be less able to experience women as whole people with intelligible needs and feelings, feelings for and needs of autonomy, emotional safety, attunement, trust. Um, and they may be less able to make sense of their own needs for connection, transmuting them instead into distorted but more socially mirrored forms. So essentially what this is saying is that if men are socialized into toxic masculinity if they if they socialized not to recognize exactly in the way that they were taught not to recognize in that bullying example not to recognize their needs for care their needs for love their own internal feelings of vulnerability if they can't rec if they're if they're forced if they're not allowed to recognize those in themselves they will also be unable to recognize those in others um, and they will also either feel contempt towards those things or find those things incomprehensible in other people. This will mean specifically within the kind of gendered, traditional kind of gendered world, that when women express those things, which they are more socially allowed to and encouraged to do, that there's a danger that men firstly will find those unintelligible, that they won't, that they won't be able to understand what those needs are, and secondly, they won't feel comfortable recognizing and responding them. They won't feel comfortable um, um, respecting someone else's um, attachment needs, vulnerability, sensitivity, need for attunement, need for respect. And they won't feel comfortable meeting those needs. They'll feel like somehow that is that doesn't fit well with their with with, with their internalized toxic masculinity. Um, so that would, that, that's a huge problem, but it leads to something even worse in this model is it leads to, because men, um, who are trapped in that form of masculinity can't, um, access and make sense of and positively respond to those, to those needs and feelings, they turn them into something else and they try and manage them in other ways. Um, and precisely rather than managing them in terms of recognizing, empathically recognizing their own and other people's vulnerability, sensitivity, um, uh, support needs, they turn it into something that can fit 
with that with that model of toxic dominant not dominant um, masculinity, which is um, exercising power, exercising social control. So then it becomes a question of um, instead of instead of the domain of sexuality becoming a, a, a area of mutual respect, of mutual consent, of mutual support and understanding, it becomes an, an area, it becomes a, a space of imposition, of control, um, of sexual violence or jealous retaliation. Um, and so, 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 so what should have been the space of intimacy, sensitivity, nurturance, respect, autonomy, becomes this toxic space of um, control, aggression, violence, dominance. Um, and so, that, so in understanding um, that article on the opposite of rape culture is nurturance culture, we're going, we're going beyond people like Jackson Katz's model of saying, well, men, men, shouldn't, men, men shouldn't support these kind of social moments where women are sexually objectified or sexuality is 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 turned is 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 represented as something aggressive um we need to go even deeper than that into the kind of psychological underpinnings um and to say that that um that sexual violence is is even more deeply rooted not just in the the sort of patriarchal power structures that 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 that, that give men certain kinds of power and marginalize women in certain ways. They really embedded in the, in, in the, in, in the toxic masculine identities that involve um, the, um, the punishment and denial and repression of certain um, human qualities within men uh, and actually make it very difficult for men in certain situations to practice um the, the 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 kind of the 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 ordinary nurturance the ordinary caring um that 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 that, that is really what constitutes intimacy and this is precisely why the, the the realm of sexuality which is which is often where we culturally expect intimacy to be um is so at risk of being violated by these other things these other forms of dominance violence and control um, and why it's so painful when, when it's when it's exactly that space that is violated in that way. So we need to think then, um, in, in in terms of bringing together this whole theme, um, to move away from these deterministic ways of thinking about um, sexual aggression, these sociobiological ways, or or attributing some innate universal sort of male drive for dominance and aggression to men. Instead, we need to engage in our, in our um, primary prevention. And in engaging in primary prevention, we need to understand the contextual um, situation in which sexual violence occurs. We need to understand the way in which um, culture and society, the social structures and all elements of it, the, 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 the sort of, um, moral and religious taboos on 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 being open about sexuality of talking about sexual sexuality in a in a kind of an adult autonomous way we need to talk about the gender inequalities and the constructions of these dominant masculine roles and submissive feminine roles and and, and how these create a kind of precondition um, for sexual violence and finally, we, we, we need to talk about the way in which, which non, men who are not perpetrators, men who are simply, simply participants in masculine culture, um, inadvertently, often unconsciously support exactly those elements of, of kind of gender polarization and masculine identity that, 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 that create high risk situations. And that as our kind of secondary intervention, we need, to, we need to work out how to get men better at dismantling and not participating in the eroticization of sexual violence, the normalization of sexual violence, the sexual objectification of people. And thirdly, what we need to do is get really deep into 
the kind of psychological structures of toxic masculinity to look at how the 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 denial of men access into their own fundamental emotional needs their needs for safety nurturance care um, the capacity to empathize with other people the capacity to respect those um, emotional needs in other people and to feel comfortable responding to them being consciously aware of them responding to them being conscious being being comfortable in a caring role rather than in a, in a dominating role so all of these are interlocking elements that we need to be working on um, at a, and, and, and working on in a, in a much more widespread way than simply re, re relying on a criminal justice system and a punitive approach, you know, that says, well, what we need to do is catch the perpetrators, what we need to do is castrate all rapists, whatever it is, these, the, that, that the idea that punishment will solve the problem of sexual violence rather than preventative intervention that fundamentally changes the context in which it becomes a risk.